Welcome to this month's Schumann Talk, where we're discussing issues we face in Europe today in the light of Robert Schumann's vision for a community of peoples deeply rooted in Christian values. That was his vision uh, for Europe. On May the 9th, 1950, at 6 p.m., the French Foreign Minister Robert Schumann gave a three-minute speech in which he laid the foundation for the European House, where today 450 million Europeans live together in peace. This is why we send out this Schumann talk on the ninth day of each month at 6 p.m., because this was, in my book, the, the defining moment of post-war Europe, for it launched a European movement for peace and unity that has led to today's European Union. Now, <clears throat> Robert Schumann's personal faith prompted him to enter the public square to promote peace, reconciliation, and justice. It really shaped his lifestyle and politics. He didn't use religious jargon, but his political compass was his deep faith in God, his understanding of human beings as created in God's image, possessing an inherent dignity and value. He believed in the separation of the spheres of church and state, but he understood that politics was shaped by beliefs. Faith and politics were inseparable because every politician held a belief or hold, held beliefs. And so today we're going to be talking with uh, Dr. Christine Sleeser about this uh, very issue of the relationship between faith, politics, and other areas of public life. She is a public theologian. Uh, she's the director of studies at the Center for Faith and Society in Fribourg University in Switzerland. So we want to welcome you, uh, Christine, to this yeah. month's Schumann Talk. And, Thanks so much. Uh, we met for the first time just recently uh, in the study days in Fribourg University with the Center for Faith and and Society, and um, so I uh, I want to ask you uh, to explain a little bit um, what is this center and what goes on there. Uh, tell us about the development and your involvement. Uh, in the center. I'd be delighted to do that. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Our Center for Faith and Society at Fribourg University seeks to build bridges between uh, academia and society and the churches. Sometimes academia, you know, is perceived as uh, sitting more or less in like an ivory tower and uh, without much interaction with the real life world. So we are actually trying to connect these different spheres of engagement. And we are an ecumenical center uh, with people coming from very different denominational backgrounds. And the idea is to, um, to be a part of uh, the public theology that you have just so aptly described in the words of Robert Schumann. Now, that term public theology is not such a, a common uh, term. Uh, I think you would be accurately described yourself as a public theologian. Can you describe what that means in your own words? Public theology for me uh, holds on to two things, basically. It holds on to the relevance of theology for the public spheres. So what we do in theology, what we believe as Christians matters for the public spheres. And the public spheres, I would say that is not only politics, but also includes economics, uh, civil society, uh, cultural communication. So it's a wide understanding of the public spheres. And public theology holds on to another thing, namely the relevance of the public spheres for theology. So what is going on out there? What is happening? Our challenges that we all face on this planet together matters for how we think in theology, how we do theology. That is for me the core of public theology. So in other words, so, uh, for, for most of us, we associate theology with the church or with our personal spiritual life. 
but you're saying it has so much more relevant Monday to Saturday as well. Absolutely. It's not only about uh, what we do, what we believe, what we pray on Sunday, but also how we act, how we how we deal with our challenges Monday through Saturday. And actually one of the great conversation partners, at least for German speaking public theology, you know, public theology is a global phenomenon. So it uh, uh, it is at home in very different contexts, but in German speaking theology, it's particularly uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who has become a, a very productive conversation partner. And this, um, the rejection of the dichotomy between private religious on the one hand and secular public on the other hand. This is exactly what uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer also fought against very passionately at his own time. Now tell us about now, the event where you and I just uh, met. You were one of the moderators um, of the study days. Uh, Tell, tell us how that has evolved and, and, and who you bring together on those study days and what your, what your yeah, uh, intended outcome is. It was a wonderful occasion, Jeff, to meet you there in Fribourg now a couple of weeks ago. Our study days uh, took place this time for the 10th time. So we had an anniversary that we were celebrating together. And the study days actually emerged from the very vision that I tried to outline at the beginning to build bridges between academia and the churches, the congregations and society at large. So once a year, we bring together engaging speakers from different parts of the world. We also try to include um, perspectives that are not as present in German speaking theology as they could be, we think. So this year's topic was actually cultural witness. And we wrestled with the question, how Christian witness, what shape could Christians take in our societies and our cultures today? And how can we communicate the good news in a way that is attractive and intelligent and comprehensible? Okay, now okay. We, we may have actually, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, the video, I, I don't know if this is going to work, but let's see if this, um, this is actually the, the, the first um, slide of um, a video explaining what this event is about, that, uh, in which you are being interviewed as well. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work. Maybe it's not working. Okay, um, that's fine. Uh, one of the, when you talked about um, cultural witness, this is actually a term um, that's being used by Graham Tomlin, who was the former Bishop of Kensington. He's now set up the Center for Cultural Witness. Um, tell us about his input on, in this event. Yes, well, he his center actually uh, gave the name to this year's study days. Um, the Center for Cultural Witness uh, in London, uh, under the directorship of former Bishop of Kensington, Graham Tomlin, has become a very close and dear partner of our study center because we uh, perceive that our visions are very closely aligned. And the way we try to uh, find creative and intelligent ways of communicating the good news in our societies, uh, they are very similar in some respects, um, just as our center, also Graham's center, rests on three pillars. And that is for one, science communication. That is, again, the idea that what we do in academia doesn't stay in academia, but actually is communicated to the broader public and the second pillar is research. We also do hardcore, top-notch uh, research at our institutions. And the third pillar, that is extended education to offer workshops, to offer courses. In our case, we do, um, uh, it's called a 
CAS, a Certificate of Advanced Studies, which gives you 15 ECTS credit points at the universities. And we are now in the process of extending that into an MAS, that's a Master of Advanced Studies, um, focusing on foundational questions in Christian existence and how that relates to how we are, how we shape church in our very specific contexts. So we want to equip people, non-theologians, um, to be church in a theologically educated and ecumenical and very much understandable for everybody um, in uh, such a way. It was uh, my privilege to work together with Graham uh, presenting a seminar on that third pillar you were talking about, the importance of Christian education today. Um, how can people who are listening, um, can can they be involved in these kinds of events in the future? Who do you hold this uh, these study days for? We aim at a very broad um, public, actually. Um, we have now also uh, adapted the name. We now call the study days a forum, the Forum Faith and Society. When you look back in antiquity, the forum, the marketplace, that is where you meet people, you exchange ideas, you network, um, you, you discuss and uh, the important topics of the day, they are discussed at the forum. So we aim at people from very different walks of life. Um, we have very young people, that's actually the majority of the forum, um, in their 20s up to retired people, uh, people who are full-time engaged in their congregations, but also people who uh, uh, work voluntarily in the congregations, people from academia, students, uh, you name it. Everyone is there. This time we had over 600 people who joined us in Fribourg. Four speakers, not only such as Graham Tomlin, uh, but also Heinrich Bedford Strom, who is with uh, WCC. He's, and, he's, uh, he's the chairman Holland. of the World Council of Churches, yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So we were privileged to have him with us. And also Tom Holland, um, who is uh, the, the um, very renowned historian in Great Britain. You might know him from his podcast series, The Rest is History. Yes. So he was a wonderful speaker. And with this year's topic on cultural witness, we also try to include people from um, the, the arts, such as um, painting. We had um, Michael Triegel with us, who... Uh, um, uh, who became famous for painting Pope Benedict. And we had Esther Maria Magnus with us, um, who uh, uh, wrote a book that gained a lot of traction in the German-speaking realm, God Doesn't Need You. That's the title of her book. And uh, so we tried to include different people from different walks of life. Now, where can people no. find the videos of, uh, of this event? Well, you can go to our homepage. Actually, if you type in in your browser, Glaube und Gesellschaft, that would be faith and society in German. And then you can, uh, we have an English homepage as well. So you click on English and then you can find the, um, the videos and the audios from our event. So some of the... So some of the English and some in, in German, and everything was translated uh, German, French, and English. Is that correct? That is correct. So the whole event was in three languages, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Christine, you've you've studied in quite a few different centers. Um, am I correct in saying you in in uh, Fuller? Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, in Pasadena. And Africa, yeah, and South Africa was that? Is that? You're associated, you give lectures there. Have you did you study in South Africa? I did not study there. I am, uh, I've been associated like a research fellow, um, associated with Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And there, I work with the chair for studies in historical trauma and transformation together with Pumla Gobodo Madikizela. 
Uh, she was um, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission together with Desmond Tutu. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, talking about well-known names, you also studied in Tübingen under That's Professor Dr. Jürgen Moltmann, who recently just passed away at the age of uh, 98. Um, yeah. Tell us about this man. Why is he considered to be one of the most, if not the most, influential theologian of the last half of the last century? as a public the theologian? Well, Jürgen Moltmann, I think, was actually one of the greatest uh, German-speaking uh, theologian of his time and beyond. He uh, impressed me personally very much by, uh, by his openness on the one hand and his centeredness on the other. He, I once asked him uh, what shaped him the most and he said, well, I drink from many wells and that stuck with me. Um, his ecumenical breath, I think, is quite amazing. He had no fear whatsoever, um, whether it be with regards to orthodoxy or um, or Catholicism. His own tradition was reformed Christianity, but uh, he wasn't uh, uh, hesitant to mingle with uh, the free churches, with evangelicals, and um, that also translated into his very international reach. His books are translated, I don't even know in how many languages, and he has shaped theology far beyond the German-speaking realm, mm -hmm. uh, going into mm -hmm. Latin America, into South Africa. I think especially um, uh, the idea of um, where, where people are facing difficult circumstances, oppression and... Um, you know, Moltmann himself, he experienced World War II. So his own biography, of course, is compelling and gripping. So his wrestling with the question of where is God in the midst of suffering? Where is God after Auschwitz? How can we even do theology after Auschwitz? Mm -hmm. I think that resonated with many people around the world. And at the same time, you know, his ecumenical wide horizon corresponded to a deeply centered Christocentricity. Jesus Christ was always at the heart of his thinking, of his theology. And these two aspects, the wide horizon and the deep roots in Christology, that is what impressed me a lot. You mentioned you mentioned experience. Um, he this he was actually a prisoner of war, a German soldier as a prisoner of war, and it was in the prison camp where he found God. Um, and and yet the post-war experience with Auschwitz and the big questions of well, where is God in this all? For many people, uh, they lost their faith, but for him, the war experience was one of finding faith. Uh, did you ever talk to him about that? Yes, well, he uh, spoke quite freely about that, also in his autobiography, for example, which was also translated into English. Um, I think it's called White Space, something like that. Um, and there he, he, he very much wrote about his experiences in the war. I think when you experience something like that, it, it never leaves you and it impacts you for life. And in the case of his theology, it also impacts his theology. The experience of when, when, when he was a young boy, 16 years old, he was being drafted in the German army to defend Hamburg, um, his, his hometown. And he oftentimes uh, recalled how he was um, commissioned to, uh, to defend a bridge together with his best friend, another boy. Um, and then the, the firestorm happened and uh, a bomb fell and tore his friend to pieces. Mm -hmm. And he was left there. He survived. And he, he, always, res he always wrestled 
with this situation and with the question, where where is God in all this? And then when he was taken prisoner of war, you know, he he grew up in a in a, a family that was not churchy at all, um, very little religious social socialization. Um, so when he was in that prisoner of war camp and he got his fingers on some theology, that was actually a new world for him. And one that he became drawn into and that never left him. He's particularly, He's particularly well for his book, Theology of Hope. And um, I remember it was uh, more than 30 years ago, 35 years ago, um, as I took on a role as European Director for Youth with a Mission, we were trying to explore what, what is our hope for Europe. And I drew very much uh, from his writings then uh, concerning um, what can we expect concerning uh, the future? How can we still have hope uh, without necessarily uh, having uh, optimistic forecasts of the of our future and and I, I think that's one of the main themes that he's uh, been remembered for is his theology of hope um, yes absolutely and i think that is something that we we should rediscover actually um when you, like just yesterday someone mentioned a current poll done with german youth and one thing that actually keeps popping up is the lack of hope and of course, that is coupled with disillusionment and lack of trust and fear of the future. So the question surrounding hope, you know, what, what is the difference between hope and mere optimism and let's hope for the best? Or um, So where is where can we find hope that is actually rooted, that has substance to it? And this is something I think that we can learn from from Moltmann, who, of course, grounded hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. The, the, um, we, could, we could spend a lot of time on that particular uh, theme, but I want to ask you uh, to talk about the theme that you really work on mostly, and that is what is the relevance of religion uh, in global matters? And you have been um, writing... Uh, you've edited and co-edited and written several volumes uh, on this theme. And when we talk about religion, uh, we're talking specifically more about the Christian understanding, Christian faith. Um, and I'm reminded of a book called um, Religion, The Missing Dimension of Statecraft that um, by Douglas and Sampson, I think it must be now nearly 30 years old, um, which was trying to answer this question, what, what is the role that religion has played in reconciliation, uh, especially? And the authors were trying to find this across the board, uh, Hinduism, Islam, and so on. But they found themselves really, uh, the only real examples they could find uh, were Christian ones. And uh, specifically was the story of Robert Schumann, Conrad Adenauer, and the post-war reconciliation in Europe, which was my particular area of interest. Now, I have been uh, wonderfully surprised to discover a whole range of books that you're involved in. Uh, perhaps we can, we can see this range um, uh, to do with religion in global matters. And when we look at the significance of the religion for the strategic development goals or conflict and conflict resolution, a deliberative democracy, human rights, and there are more. Tell us about this series and your involvement in it. Well, um, the series, actually, the idea for this series emerged in 2019 when I was a resident research fellow at the Center for Theological Inquiry at um, Princeton uh, University. And um, there I had the privilege to be part of a wonderful international and interreligious group. And we were all uh, working on the topic of religion and violence. And one of my uh, group, one of the members of my group was Pauline Kollontai, a um, wonderful scholar with a Jewish background based at York St. John University in the UK. And 
together with her, we first, my idea was, okay, let's join our projects that we are working on um, to maybe make them into a volume. And then I thought, no, wait a minute, why not do an entire book series? Because clearly religion is the force that matters so much to the vast majority of this planet's population. Um, last year, another um, major survey came out from World Population Funds uh, saying that 80% of this planet's population adhere to a faith tradition or Pew Research Center. Um, came out with a with a with a huge study saying that the 21st century will be religious all major faith traditions with the exception of buddhism interestingly for some reason but all other faith traditions will grow in numbers and will grow in influence in mm. this century so what we are experiencing here in our context, in the Netherlands, in Germany, Switzerland, many parts of Western Europe, the decline of institutionalized religion, the decline of our churches, you know, memberships going down. This is actually when we look from a global perspective, this is the exception, not the rule. So what we are noticing here is, and that ties back to the beginning of our conversation, we have become blind on our religious eye. We are still so gripped by the post-enlightenment paradigma, which relegates religion to the private sphere only, similar to our preferences for for food or whatever you know it's my my personal my private preference and has nothing to do with the public sphere and that i think is disastrous because that blocks out so much of reality for uh, the majority of this planet's population and the challenges that we face today and the vision that is captured so aptly in the 17 SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, addressing issues such as poverty, hunger, climate change, education, gender equality. And we think we as religious people have nothing to say about this? I don't think so. 80% of our planet's population have a lot to say about this. Religion influences how we think, how we act, or how we don't act. So this, all this to say that this is the idea that actually gave birth to this interreligious book series. We uh, brought on board another fantastic uh, Muslim scholar, Aisha Karayifchi Orlana, based at Georgetown University. And together, Pauline, Aisha, and myself, we edit this book series. And the idea is to get um, teams of authors who work together on a volume and who speak from an insider perspective. We're not interested about what people say about other people's religions. We want people to speak from the insider perspective, not uncritically, of course, um, mm -hmm. But to act, as Michael Walzer calls it, the imminent critique, but to, to explore what role religion, their religion plays, let's say, in education, in climate change, in poverty alleviation. So, so it raises a lot of interesting questions because what would your Muslim friend say is the contribution of Islam to gender equality? Well, we actually have a wonderful volume out on uh, religion and gender-based violence against women and girls, um, which was co-written together by a Christian colleague, um, Elisabeth Leroux, based at Stellenbosch University, and a Muslim scholar, Sandra Imam Pertek, based in the UK. And together they wrestle with the questions. And of course, every faith tradition is ambivalent. Um, in, in my own faith tradition, Christianity, I know Christianity has been abused for the most horrendous things. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Crusades up to Northern Ireland uh, conflict and uh, many other um, religiously based conflicts in today. today. <laughs> uh, exactly. We have Kirill. Um, 
uh, abusing Christianity and trying to give a theological justification of the horrendous war in in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. up to this this very day, um, we have the misuse of religion as well. But that is only one side of the coin. And unfortunately, that is the side of the coin that is most often portrayed in the media. So we know a lot about the destructive and the problematic sides of religion. But we know very little about the constructive potentials, the rich resources that each faith tradition has for, you mentioned reconciliation before, or for conflict transformation, for motivating people to engage in education, to reach those um, who, who struggle with poverty and with hunger. So our aim is actually to shed light, light not only on the problematic sides of religion, but also of the rich resources that we can tap into. Are you, are Are you the same uh, difficulty that Sampson and, and uh, uh, Douglas um, ran into trying to write a book about religion, the missing dimension mm -hmm. of statecraft, and finding it very difficult to find uh, credible examples outside of the Christian religion? Or are you actually making some very interesting discoveries? Well, um, we're actually making very interesting discoveries indeed. Um, I think not only the Christian religion has tremendous resources to address today's challenges, but basically every faith traditions, tradition has, um, has incredible potential. And just uh, two days ago, I was in a meeting with a very new initiative um, initiated by Aza Karam, the former General Secretary for Religions for Peace. And she commissioned a group of women together for an initiative called Lead Integrity. And as this group, we as the different women participating in it, of well, we do have some male advisors, but the partners, it's a, it's a women-led initiative. We come from very different faith perspectives. And when I listen to my friends on this, uh, on this initiative, I'm just blown away by the, by the remarkable strengths and resources that each one brings to the table. And each one of these fabulous women, they're involved in very different things. They are involved in, in AI, in, um, education, in filmmaking. Um, and they bring their faith traditions on the table and they showcast what, um, what riches are hidden in their faith tradition. And I think the particular strength actually lies when we come together. Um, I think our global challenges that we face today, not one single academic discipline, not one single person, not one single country or one single faith tradition can solve everything. I think um, we, we must work together. That's most fascinating. That's most Tell us about your own uh, uh, personal journey and, and background. Well, I grew up um, as a pastor's kid. Uh, my father was a Lutheran pastor. And so I became very early familiarized with, uh, um, with the Christian faith tradition. And Where that was is something. That? Sorry? Where was that? Where was that? Well, I was born in Bavaria and then my family moved to northern Germany. Um, that is why I never acquired the beautiful Bavarian accent. I wish I could uh, actively speak it, but I grew up uh, in the area of Hanover, so I have a very boring um, standard German uh, kind of language. 
Um, so that's where I grew up, and um, I I was raised in a in a, a ha in a home where faith mattered, where faith played a major role in everyday life. Not only on Sundays when my dad would preach in church, but also Monday through Saturday, and that's a blessing. That's that's a wealth I have um, uh, from my childhood on. And um, of course, I had my own struggles, my own challenges as I went on to university, studied theology, and um, then went on to Fuller, where another whole horizon was opened up to me. Tübingen, of course, at my time uh, was just amazing. You know, you had the, the big names there. You had Jürgen Moltmann, you had Hans Küng, you had uh, Eberhard Jüngel. It was like like an Eldorado of theology, I would say. But at the same time, it was very, um, well, of course, um, the focus was on German speaking theology. Mm. So I studied a lot of Luther. Um, and when I came to Fuller, I remember one, <laughs> one episode in particular, we were sitting in class and we were discussing some systematic um, theological question. And I was thinking to myself, oh, okay, well, what did Luther say to this? And okay, so I raised my hand and I spoke up and I said, well, uh, Luther, of course, said this and that. And then I thought, okay, question resolved. Let's move on to the next one. And 29 people turned around and faced me. And then my friend Sunday from Nigeria spoke up and looked at me and said, Chrissy, why Luther? <laughs> <laughs> and it dawned on me, if it hadn't dawned on me before, that there are possibly more uh, faith traditions beside the Lutheran faith in the world. And that just opened up a whole new world also in theology. So you so just you Sunday, uh, Sunday Agang, who edited the... Uh, book called African Public Theology. That's correct. That's right. That is yes. him. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's, he's, he's one of the voices coming out of Africa, along with others like Dion Forster, whom I think you've also uh, met and worked with, uh, yes. who are seeing the, the need for this broadly based uh, public theology. Yeah, in a sense, um, when you say Luther, from the reform perspective, people like Abraham Kalper would say, well, Luther's theology was so limited. It, it took Calvin to give us the understanding of the sovereignty of God over all spheres of life and hence broadened the base for a, a public theology. Uh, and you're saying yourself, you began to, like uh, Moltmann said, uh, drink from many wells. Uh, is that your advice to us? Absolutely. I would. I would advise everyone to drink from many wells, or as St. Paul put it, you know, you sample everything and keep the good. Um, and, you know, I tell my students at university, uh, please try at least to go abroad for one semester. Try to get out of your comfort zone. Try to get to know some very different theology. Maybe go to South Africa or go to South Korea or I don't know where. Go somewhere else and get to know um, how people live their Christian faith. And maybe not only the Christian faith, maybe also other faith traditions, but um, get to know a different horizon, a different perspective. And that is actually one thing that I very much appreciate about um, public theology, that it is a global phenomenon. Um, but at the same, and of course, it's not only a Christian phenomenon. You know, uh, I would say that our, our book series, Religion Matters, that's an example of public theology coming together from different faith traditions. Um, but with all the beauty that lies with the different contexts of uh, Christian public theology, I would say there's also a slight danger um, connected to it. Um, and that is that we might be in danger of losing contour when we are faced with all the different contexts and the different challenges. So my plédoyer would be to focus on 
And again, you hear Moltmann shining through and Dietrich Bonhoeffer to focus on Christology as the heartbeat of public theology. Um, to have Jesus Christ as the center. If our center is strong and firmly rooted, then we can have a wide perspective. Or as Graham Tomlin might say it, that's the generous orthodoxy. If we have a core, if we have, if we keep our Christian, our Christological heartbeat, then we can be generous in our horizon. That's a very good place to end our conversation on Christine. Thank you so much. Um, one of the steps that people take too is to plan to come and join you all in uh, Freiburg next uh, year, April, the, towards the end of April, isn't it? Uh, I, I don't have the dates in front of me. We can put them up on the screen. Um, plus also the website whereby people can find more information. Uh, well, next study days, if I may very briefly interrupt, they will be in June, actually. Oh. I'm yes. sorry. Yes, Most June. Like the end of June, and this, uh, this or or next time, we'll have NT Wright with us, and the topic will be resurrection, resurrecting the resurrection. I think we can hardly become more central um, and relevant in terms of topics uh, than the resurrection. So, yeah. everyone who's listening, welcome to Freiburg. Join us for resurrecting the resurrection. And you've brought us back to that, uh, the great foundation for Christian hope, the resurrection. And Absolutely. you've just mentioned Graham Tomlin's name. He's going to be our guest uh, next month as we explore uh, the aspect of um, cultural witness. And um, I'm sure it's going to be uh, as stimulating as it has been talking with you, Christine. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was a pleasure to be with you all.